This is a star. This is a galaxy. And this is a new asteroid. We recently found not tens, not hundreds, but 2104 never before seen asteroids in our solar system, including seven near Earth asteroids in just seven nights of observations of a very small patch of the sky using the new Vera C. Rubin Observatory. So, this thought came to my mind that many of you must be thinking if ground based telescopes are that good, why do we need to spend so much money on telescopes like James Webb? Well, this is a valid question to ask, but they both serve different purposes. You see, Vera Rubin Observatory is perched high at nearly 2700 meters in Chile's Atacama Desert with its colossal celestial camera. Its primary mirrors span 8.4 meters, capturing vast swaths of the sky in a single shot, roughly 40 times the area of the full moon or 9.6 square degrees. But the true marvel lies behind the lens. A 3.2 gigapixel camera, the largest ever constructed, capable of collecting 15 terabytes of image data each clear night. Rubin's mission is to capture the cosmic movie, frame by frame, as it scans the entire southern sky, detecting changes and movements that can last anywhere from milliseconds to years. Supernovae will explode in distant galaxies. Comet will strike across our view and near-Earth asteroids. Some potentially hazardous will be catalogued and tracked. Variable stars, gravitational wave counterparts, and perhaps entirely new never-seen-before phenomena will all emerge from this torrent of data. So Rubin may seem like the ultimate survey telescope. Wide, deep, fast, and relentless in its search for cosmic change. But there is a problem. Have you ever tried to look at the moon using your camera? If you have, you must have noticed this turbulence. This is one of the biggest challenges for any ground-based telescope, including the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Air near the ground is warmer and dense. Higher layers are cooler and less dense. As these layers mix, they create continuously shifting pockets of air with significantly different refractive indices. When starlight passes through, each patch of air bends the light a tiny amount. Since the turbulent cell evolve on millisecond time scales, the result is a constantly twinkling image that blurs to about 0.5 to 1 arc seconds of resolution at a good site. For comparison, Hubble Space Telescope delivers 0.05 arc seconds. This blurring, called seeing, smears out details. Two stars closer than the seeing limit appears as one, and faint structures in galaxies get washed out. To overcome this problem, observatories are built atop mountains like Shiro Pachon for Rubin at 2700 meters to reduce the amount of air above and select regions with extremely low water vapor. This is where we need space telescopes like James Webb or Hubble. James Webb is at around 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth, orbiting a gravitational sweet spot known as the Sun-Earth L2 point. It has 6.5 meter segmented mirrors, a mosaic of 18 hexagonal beryllium segments that collects light in wavelengths from 0.6 to 28.5 microns, far beyond the reach of most ground-based observatories. Waves telescope sized sun shield blocks heat and stray light, allowing its instruments to cool to a frigid 50 Kelvin. In this pristine airless environment, WAVE can peer through clouds of cosmic dust to reveal stars being born, study the composition of exoplanets' atmospheres, and glimpse the faint glimmers of the universe's early galaxy. WAVE, by contrast, operates in 0.1 to 0.7 arc second diffraction limited resolution at 2 microns, which can unveil fine details invisible to even the largest ground based telescopes. WAVE's infrared vision lets it study the first stars, the dusty cocoons of stellar nurseries, and the chemical fingerprints of exoplanet atmospheres, water vapor, carbon dioxide, hazes, and more. But WAVE's field of view is tiny, about 0.014 square degrees per pointing, so it cannot conduct all sky surveys. And once launched, it cannot be physically upgraded or repaired, unlike Hubble. And its operational life is caved by the finite fuel reserves 
currently projected to last at least a decade. Rubin's single 8.4 meter mirror uses a 3 meter design to deliver a wide 9.6 square degree fields of view, which means it can image a huge swath of the sky in a single 15 second exposure, enabling full sky surveys every few nights. In other words, Rubin sees about 7400 times more sky area in one shot than Wave, trading breadth for Wave's unmatched depth and infrared sensitivity. So, where Rubin will scan vast regions of sky to catch transient events and map millions of objects, we will zoom in on targets for extraordinary detail. Both are flagship facilities, but serve complementary roles. There is no competition or comparison between them. So, you can think like this. Once Vera Rubin finds something extraordinary, maybe a supernova or an asteroid that can pose danger to Earth, James Webb's eyes will be put on that to look at it with more detail. Although Rubin is just beginning operations, its first test images have already demonstrated its power. Since launch, Wave has already made headline discoveries. It has detected galaxies and black holes at record distances, probing only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. For example, we found the most distant active supermassive black hole yet in galaxy, Ceres 1019, just 750 million years after Big Bang, and identified a population of very early galaxies. In our own solar system, we have imaged planets and rings like capturing Jupiter's infrared auroras. Both will tackle dark matter and dark energy, but from different angles. Rubin maps the distribution of dark matter via weak lensing, which is a phenomenon in which the light from distant sources is slightly distorted by the gravity of intervening mass. Wave can study individual lensing galaxies and distant supernovae in detail. Together, they form a powerful duo that fills gaps in each other's capabilities to create a more comprehensive understanding of the universe.